<laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's so good to see you. I'm really excited to have the chance to do our first evening at Egan. And really happy to have Arts and Sciences presenting these events for you and to be your host. Um, so much, I love this. I love Egan. I love our library. I think it's so beautiful. I think it's a really warm, cozy place to do these events. Um, so I'm just really excited tonight to do this. Um, I want to start off tonight with a land acknowledgement. Our campuses reside on the unceded territories of the Akquan, Tantaquan, and Chitkaquan on Thingit Ani, also known as Juneau, Ketchikan, and Sitka, Alaska. We acknowledge that the Thingit peoples have been stewards of the land on which we work and reside since time immemorial. We are grateful for that stewardship and incredible care. We also recognize that our campuses are adjacent to the ancestral home of the Hadas and Simsian, and we commit to serving their peoples with equity and care. We recognize the series of unjust actions that attempted to remove them from their land, which includes forced relocations and the burning of villages. We honor the relationships that exist between Tlingit, Hadas, and Simsian peoples, their sovereign relationships to their lands, their languages, their ancestors, and future generations. We aspire to work toward healing and liberation, recognizing our paths are intertwined in the complex histories of colonization in Alaska. We acknowledge that we arrived here by listening to the peoples, elders, lessons from the past, and these stories carry us as we weave a healthier world for future generations. I want to specifically recognize our new chancellor, Dr. Aparna Palmer. Aparna, could you give a little wave? <laughs> For those of you who don't know our new chancellor, please take the time and get to know her. We're so thrilled to have her with us here at UAS, and I'm really enjoying getting to know her. So thank you, Dr. Palmer, for joining us this evening. I also am so excited to see a friend here with us this evening. Thank you, Richard Peterson, for joining us. Richard is the president of Thingit and Haida. Richard, thanks for joining us here this evening. I also just learned that Richard and Shingo know each other uh, well already, and have gotten to know each other both and seen each other on Prince of Wales and in Sitka. So I'm so excited to know that you've already met and had the chance to talk and get to know each other. Um, also, I want to let everybody know that in the back there, we've got an alumni and friends table set up. And for those of you who do not know about alumni and friends, get to know them. So here's what they're looking for. Your ideas and your energy and uh, new ideas that we don't have yet. And if you're an alum of UAS um, and you're not, if you don't know about alumni and friends, please get to know them. Uh, Robbie Stelk. Robbie, can you give a little like wave? Stand, Robbie Stelk. So Ro Robbie's going to be here, and alumni and friends are going to be here at all of our evening and Egan events. And she really just wants people to get to know, and not just alums, it's alumni and friends. So you're, if you're a friend of UAS, get to know that organization. And they really do. They want to infuse alumni and friends with some new ideas and new energy this year. So please take a moment to stop by the table, say hello, and get to know them. Um, and now I have the very distinct pleasure of introducing you to Dr. Shingo Hamada. We're so happy to have him with us. Um, uh, we've had him with us here since last February. Dr. Hamada is an associate professor of food studies uh, with the Faculty of Liberal Arts, um, Osaka Shoin Women's University in Osaka, Japan. He's currently in Juneau with us on a Fulbright as a research fellow in affiliation with our School of Arts and Sciences here at UAS. He's also a research associate in the uh, Department of Anthropology at Indiana University. Dr. Hamada is also a research associate for the Nippon Foundation Ocean Nexus Center at the University of Washington and a research collaborator for the National Museum of Ethnology in Japan. He received a master's degree in anthropology from Portland State University and then finished his uh, PhD in anthropology at Indiana University, my alma mater also. Um, he started his research on the environmental history and cultural politics of seafood in coastal communities in northern Japan. 
Using ethnographic research methods and the approaches in the anthropology of science, his dissertation research investigated how a collaborative stock enhancement program for regional herring stocks developed in Japan, while managerial responsibility and coastal stewardship are blurred in a network of different social groups. Dr. Hamada's research has been supported by the uh, National Science Foundation, the Wenner Gren Foundation, and the Japan Society of the Promotion of Science, and now, of course, by the US Japan Fulbright Scholarship Program. Shingo is currently working on a book manuscript, putting together 15 years of research on the history and contemporary isu issues of herring, fishery, and food culture in Japan. And I'm thrilled to have him kick off our Evening at Egan series. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Shingo Hamada. Uh, good evening. Is the mic's on? Good evening. Uh, thank you, Karim, for the wonderful introduction. Here's your cell phone, just in case you forgot. It's not, mine. And it's not yours, OK. Down here All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a wonder. Yeah. It's a wonderful introduction. Thank you very much. And also, uh, uh, personally, I, want to, I also want to acknowledge the clinic people as the owner of the, the caretaker of this land. And also, uh, as you can notice, you know, there are some children running around in the back, uh, including my kids and uh, my kids' friends. And uh, uh, they might make some noise, but uh, one of the things I learned from uh, native people here, Klingit people, the Haida people, is that uh, treating children with the respect and the care. And I'm really glad that my kids are here. I don't know if they are listening to my lecture today, but uh, I hope you guys also bear with you know my kids and uh, other children who are here to learn and learn about you know, our relationship, the historical, historical and contemporary relationship between our us human society and environment. Uh, so uh, today uh, I put my title in the presentation: the Eating the Herring Rifts and Responses in the North Pacific. That's a huge word, but uh, uh, I later in the, in my presentation I'll explain why I put Eating the Herring in the, in the title. So today's uh, my you know lecture is about uh, the herring. Uh, I've been doing the research on herring in the past 14 or 15 years. Uh, the reason why I'm doing the research on herring is that uh, there are so many scholars doing research on salmon. <laughs> there are so many people doing research on kelps. I need to find my niche as a scholar. <laughs> now, actually, now, uh, that's what I really one of the reasons, but uh, I realized that not so many people are doing the research on the herring. The herring is a very, very important fishery species, the species in the ocean. You know, salmon eat herring, whales eat herring, and the herring is a really a uh, cultural, ecological keystone species. F it's very important for our sustainable, the healthy ecosystem. So I figured, you know, the salmon need to do some research on the herring from a cultural perspective and also historical perspective. And uh, the social scientists are uh, doing the research on the human ocean relationship in many ways, but the mainly they're kind of the social scientific research of the ocean-human relationship uh, falls under three categories. Uh, one is the, the study of uh, traditional ecological knowledge. And another one is the research on uh, resource management. Both are very important. And the third one is the social construction of oceans and how we think about ocean, how we recognize ocean. And uh, these things are very important, but at the same time, as I do a research and uh, spend a lot of time with fishermen, uh, I, sp I realize that uh, as much time as I spend in uh, fishing and uh, talking about uh, fishing, the resource management, I eat a lot of fish. And the fishermen talks a lot about eating fish, the taste of the fish. So that's why my research starts shifting a little bit in from production to a consumption. So that's why you know, I'm doing a research on the food studies. 
So at the, at the end of the presentation, I will explain what food study is and how, why we need to do research, um, do ne why we need to do more research on food aspect. And uh, this is a public lecture, so I don't mean to do really uh, academic, jargonish lecture, but uh, here's some key in concept that I want to mention in my presentation. Metabolism. Uh, that's, that's something we need, you know, we learned at the junior high and the high school. Metabolism is uh, something that we, our body, you know, use food and uh, change the food into the energy, which is very important for our survival and the body function. And the social scientists uh, actually use this uh, idea of metabolism to study about uh, society and uh, society and environmental relationship. So social metabolism means that you know, how we, the human society, use resources for social reproduction. How we use resources to make a sustainable social, uh, a social relationship. So that's something I want to talk about in this lecture. And also, but uh, when we have, we have a lot of issues in terms of using uh, fisheries resource management. And then when we, then I want to mention the, the concept of a metabolic rift, basically a gap. And uh, there are many rifts uh, that I mentioned in this lecture, but at the same time, in, but in this lecture, you know, we don't have uh, much time, so I want to mention specifically uh, one uh, rift called, what I call the gastronomic rift. And then at the end, I want to talk about the importance of uh, food culture and food studies and uh, why we need to focus more on, spend more time on cooking, eating, and relating with each other. So for the herring, uh, I came here and doing the research on the herring and learning a lot from the uh, Clean Gate people, the Haida people, and I went to Sitka, I went to Plymouth Wales Island. Then, uh, gosh, I didn't know that you know, this area, the you know, Ark Bay, was one of the, the huge herring hotspot. But now, the herrings are gone here. And uh, this is a picture taken at, uh, I think, North Douglas, like 100 years ago. Look at that, this is the carpet of the herring. Herring used to be so abundant here and the native people utilize this resource you know, for a long time. And the non-native people use this resource too. But uh, you know, our, the way we use the herring resources uh, is not something we can be, we you know, could be proud of. You know, we basically overfished, over, over utilize the herring resources too much. So this is a picture you know, the, that I found from Alaska State Library Historical Collection. This picture was taken in uh, North Douglas about 100 years ago. This is a picture uh, from Hokkaido, Japan, the same, the 1910s. About a pre pretty much about the same time, same historical period, we see the same situation going on. So much having resources and uh, people try to utilize this resource as much as possible, but not for the sustainable, healthy social reproduction. Jap uh, Japanese people, I mean, a lot of people use these human resources to accumulate the capital. So the benefit of resource, local resources goes elsewhere. So herring uh, was uh, really abundant in Hokkaido Island of Japan, and the herring fishery was actually one of the, the biggest modern fishery, uh, fishery in Japanese history. But uh, the history of the use of the herring in Japan is very similar with that we see in the South East Alaska. This is the drawing that's you know, made in uh, about uh, uh, 1800. One of the Japanese officials traveled Hokkaido. The Hokkaido used to be called Ainu Mosil, Ainu land, the homeland for the indigenous Ainu people. Uh, there, you know, the Ainu people used to harvest, they utilize the herring resources, but the ethnic Japanese people uh, came to colonize, settle Hokkaido Island. They start to use the resources, not for the Hokkaido, not for the Ainu people, but for the development of uh, agriculture in uh, mainland Japan. 
And if we see this picture, we see the uh, uh, people walking on the fisheries, uh, herrings, and ethnic Japanese, Japanese guy walking something, Japanese man walking with Ainu man, and Ainu woman walking with the Japanese woman. And they put uh, the herring together as a bundle and hung it and they make a dried herring for food and also for a fish meal fertilizer. And we see a lot of herring in, uh, in the shack too. So this, uh, this uh, picture was drawn in uh, 1800. And 50, about 50 years later, another Japanese officer uh, went to Hokkaido Island to document uh, the life of Ainu people and the document uh, and try to create a map of Hokkaido Island. And that, the person, uh, Matsushima Takeshiro, was really, uh, gosh, really shocked about how badly indigenous Ainu people are treated by the ethnic Japanese people. So uh, Matsushima Takeshiro redrew uh, the images of the herring fishery in Hokkaido Island. And this one uh, reflects the moral uh, reality of the how uh, local herring resources are overexploited along with uh, indigenous people. Mainly only Ainu people are working in the field. There's only one Japanese, but the most of the uh, less of the all the work was done by uh, Ainu people. Uh, Ainu people do use in the gillnet and the catching the herring. But uh, this is the what happened in the history of Hokkaido. Uh, herring resources are abundant. And ethnic Japanese people came to Hokkaido because they figured, OK, there are a lot of herring resources. We can produce fish meal fertilizer a lot. And we can develop agriculture in mainland Japan. And that's another good thing for ethnic Japanese people. They figured, oh, they are cheap labor. We can exploit it indigenous Ainu people. We don't have to pay. So a lot of Ainu people were exploited as men pretty much like a slave. So indigenous Ainu people, local herring stock, are exploited by ethnic Japanese people uh, to develop uh, empire of Japan. Japanese herring fishery really developed in the late 19th century. And that was before the, the fishery was you know, machinized. You know, they don't use much machines or to mechanize the vessels. They use uh, an pond net. We see a lot of you know, the fishermen catch the herring. And by that, around this time in South Alaska, you know, we have a history of a reduction fishery, right? A lot of herring resources are utilized to you know, make uh, you know, fish meals. The same in Hokkaido Island, Hokkaido of Japan. A lot of herring resources are utilized, exploited to produce fish meal fertilizer. This is how uh, fish meal fertilizer cre in the produced in Japan. Uh, they use a huge pot, boiled, and squeeze the herring and create the produce of fish meal fertilizer. A lot of herring resources are used uh, along with a lot of timbers because they need to boil the fish, so they need to clear cut a lot of trees as well. The, by that time, uh, most of the coastal area of Hokkaido were colonized by the ethnic Japanese people. A traditional way of indigenous coastal Indian people's life was pretty much disappeared, unfortunately. So that's why it was very hard for me to study about the history of a relationship between Ainu people and herring in Hokkaido because Japanese people colonized Hokkaido Island starting like 100 years ago and it wiped out the coastal Ainu villages. In the meantime, uh, Late uh, 19th century, those kind of fish meal fertilizer production continues. At the one time, 19, no, no, 1897, uh, they produce about, about pretty much one million ton of herring just using the pound net. A lot of fish meal fertilizer were produced using you know, herring along with 
uh, dried herring. Dried herring it was also used as a fish meal for the agriculture, but at the same time, dried herring was used as a food in the mainland Japan. For example, I grew up uh, in a town called Nara, which is in the mainland Japan. And the Nara is a la the landlocked prefecture. We don't have an ocean in Nara. But uh, our farmers in Nara uh, remember that they used to eat herring because dried herring came from Hokkaido Island. And those having a dried herring are used for as a fertilizer, and also the those herring, dried herring was uh, used as an important protein source as a food. But the Japanese people uh, use uh, utilize herring resources uh, too much. Uh, this is the. Uh, uh, as you can see, this is the record of a domestic herring fishery in Hokkaido, Japan. 1980s and 1987s, about a million ton of herring were harvested. But after that, the annual catch of herring just continued declining. Yes, there are some fluctuations, but it's obvious that the herring resource is declining. In 1956, herring stopped coming back to the uh, shoreline of the Hokkaido. Our commercial fishery collapsed. And of course, people talk about people with the, um, that was unbelievable. Herring resource was super abundant. There's no way that we use all the herring resources. So people, people in Japan are talking about what's going on with the herring stocks. This is a newspaper, uh, Asahi Shimbun, uh, issued in 1955, uh, two, one year before the herring stopped coming back to the shore. What caused a poor herring catch? Hokkaido fishermen are suffering. They are in trouble. What's going on with the herring fishery? It must be global warming. It's interesting. 1955, Japanese media, Japanese scholars are already talking about the impact of global warming or climate change. And they use the idea of climate change or global warming to explain why herring resources declined. Which might be true, but at the same time, they don't think that they didn't think that overfishing was the biggest cause of the stock decline of having stocks. It's so easy to point out uh, the global warming. Oh, well, that's because of global warming. Well, that's because the environment is changing. There's nothing we could do. Of course, we need to deal with the climate change, global warming, you know, seriously. But at the same time, we need to you know keep our eyes away from overfishing. Japanese herring stock declined and corrupted as a result of a combination of overfishing and the destruction of uh, habitat, coastal development, and climate change, global warming. Then, of course, you know, unfortunately, the herring resource you know, declined in Japan. And uh, then, you know, but still, a lot of people made a profit of the herring resources. And here in South Alaska, too, in the herring resources are very important commercially and also other cultural resources for, for native people. But uh, here I want to, uh, you know, put some idea of this metabolic rift. It's okay that we use herring resources. It's very important resources. But it's very important to think about how we use those official resources for what? A lot of official resources in the modern society, modern history, the past 150 years, resources are used to accumulate the capital, someone making the money. <laughs> and I don't have to talk too much about it, right? Rather than you know, creating a healthy social, you know, creating you know, sustainable, healthy local community or sustaining local ecosystem. Some might use the local resources to benefit and those benefits go elsewhere. 
That's why local community, the local environment become poor. And those things, you know, it, it happen not only about the, you know, cause the risk, cause the issue of, you know, environmental destruction. There are a lot of issues, you know, caused by such kind of uh, metabolic lift, kind of unwise, unhealthy way of use of resources. Some scholars use the term individual rift. That means we are the person uh, alienated from the nature. Our relationship with the nature environment becomes scarce. Social lift. Uh, resources are used, and while some people are making money, make a profit, we create a lot of social, uh, social stratification, social gap. Rich man become richer, the poor man become poor. Ecological lift, ecological distraction. Managerial rift. Uh, scientific knowledge used to, for the resource management, which is okay, but for some reason, uh, people who actually don't use resource became more powerful in term for the decision making resource management instead of people actually using those resources. So that's a managerial rift. Users don't have uh, much uh, power in the decision making for resource management while other people making the decision making. Geographic rift. Uh, loss of access to traditional harvesting land, traditional uh, the resources. Culture rift, or the spiritual rift. Native people here harvest a lot of herring egg, having resources, salmon, not for themselves, not just for their family. They use resources for their community. They use those resources for gift giving, culture exchange, maintain a social relationship. Without local resources, such kind of use of resource is disappear, not disappearing, but in trouble. And also, uh, I want to mention about kind of culinary rift or gastronomic rift. How a uh, development of uh, industrialized fishery or food production creates the issue of our food culture. So in Japan, as I, mean, as I shown in the graph, you know, Japanese domestic herring fishery corrupted, but uh, Japanese people were able to continue consuming herring because we import herring from the United States, from Canada, Holland, Russia, Norway. But the uh, uh, distance between production and consumption, the distance between producers and consumer expand, while other uh, variety of cost creating seafood, or having, having food, was shaded in a long distance of uh, trading. And in Japan, that's very interesting. I mean. Ja in, if we go to the supermarket in Japan, especially in Hokkaido, we still see a lot of herring product. But not many people eating herring anymore. That's because, uh, because of the gastronomic rift. If we think about the Japanese food, the Japanese food culture, we can think about sushi. Japanese people like eating sushi. We use fresh finest quality of fish to make a sushi. Tastes great, I like it. But actually, uh, a sushi eating culture in Japan at the national level, national scale, developed in 1970s, or 1960s actually. Of course, we used to have an older version of traditional fermented sushi for a long time. But if we, see, if we, if we talk about a fresh sushi, that's actually quite a new food tradition in Japan. Japanese people started eating fresh sushi when cold chain developed in the 1960s. Cold chain means we can harvest fish at the coast and we can put the fresh fish in ice and bring it to the cool uh, refrigerated truck 
to go to the fish market. With the development of a cold chain, fresh seafood started distributed throughout Japan. Then Japanese people started eating fresh, fresh raw seafood. And by that time, uh, Japan experienced a high economic growth. That means a lot of households start buying refrigerators. Refrigerator freezers, so they can put the fresh fish in the fridge, and they can enjoy fresh fish in the house. That's how Japanese sushi or fresh seafood culture developed. Japanese people start eating tuna, sardine, yellowtail, snapper, sea bream, variety of fresh, nice fish. But the, when that happened, when Japanese fresh uh, fish eating culture developed, we didn't have a fresh herring. Because Japanese domestic herring fishery corrupted by that time. Japan imported frozen herring from Canada, United States, and it tried to sell herring. How? We defrost it and sell it. It doesn't taste good. It didn't taste good. And of course, if, if you have tried eating herring, or if you like you know, fishing, we know that how bony herring is. It's very hard to process, to clean the, the herring at home. So when uh, Japanese seafood culture uh, that we know of developed in the 1970s, we didn't have a herring, the fresh herring. That's why still not many people are eating herring in Japan. And in the past, of course, you know, when herring resources were abundant, herring used to be eaten as a fresh sashimi among the fishermen or fishermen's family. But uh, the culture of eating fresh herring did not develop in Japan quite a while. It started eating again uh, in the past five or 10 years, but uh, you know, it was it, the eating of fresh herring it did not develop in Japan. So Japanese seafood culture developed and uh, become globally famous. But the herring resource uh, did not come back, herring in the stock did not come back to Japan. But the Japanese people, or fishermen in Hokkaido, uh, still remember the good time of herring fishing. That was fun, catching herring. And herring fishing, herring, herring could be a really uh, another important economic resources. So Japanese government and the Hokkaido prefecture government uh, started spending the money for the stock enhancement program. The here, in, here in the South Alaska, and Alaska, we have a salmon hatchery. So basically the same. Japanese people, you know, spend time to do the research to develop the herring hatchery. And uh, the herring hatchery really, the research really developed, especially in uh, starting like 1996. A lot of funding, a lot of researchers, and those local fishermen uh, collaborated to do the research and to the development of the herring hatchery program. So now uh, the scientists, fishing managers, local fishermen work together to restore the herring resources. Same like a salmon hatcheries. They cut off the body, the, the body of the herring, they take uh, the egg and the sperm out, and they mix it like a pancake, and uh, artificially propagate the baby herring, and release the herring. And also fishermen start doing the self-regulation, start doing the self-regulation over their fishing. Nowadays, the fishermen in Hokkaido use the gill net for herring fishing, but they use the gill net with wider mesh size, so that you know smaller herring you know wouldn't be ca wouldn't be caught. The better, then that means you know those fishermen give a younger herring a chance to spawn at least twice in their lifetime. And also, they uh, decide to shorten the fishing period. 
so that you know, more herring will have opportunity for spawning. That's the great thing about the Japanese uh, fishery management. Actually, in Japan, local fishing cooperatives have a lot of uh, power in the decision making about how they want to manage having resources, salmon resources, other fisher resources. They can decide. If they decide, okay, let's stop catching herring, they can do that. Of course, in, in the other way it goes too. If they said, and we don't have to, we don't have to regulate herring fishery, let's continue herring resources, they could do that. They could you know, make another mistake of overfishing. But so far in Japan, uh, a lot of uh, local fishing co-ops uh, put effort on the self-regulation to restore the local herring stocks. And also uh, the herring hatchery program continued. And probably thanks to the, the both of those efforts, herring resource, the herring stocks started coming back to the, the shoreline of Hokkaido recently. In the winter time, so small scale household fishermen now have a, a chance to catch herring again using a gill net, catching herring. Instead of going to the Tokyo area or Osaka area during the winter time for the, the labor work to make some money, they can stay in their home. They can continue catching the herring or the fish. So this is the local domestic herring. And they take care of fish well. If we look at the sakura herring fishing, I don't want to put the finger on it, no, no, but uh, Japanese fishermen try to treat fish nicer because now they know that you know, they don't want to use herring to produce fish meal fertilizer. They want the other value. They want the consumer to eat fresh herring for sushi and sashimi. So no, this is not just for herring, but the Japanese local fishermen you know, put the fish like this, put the ice and the herring, the fish, and put in a styrofoam box and distribute it. The thanks to those efforts, uh, annual domestic, domestic catch of herring start recovering, especially in, a, in a, the last few years. Uh, annual catch of herring uh, continue increasing. Uh, last year, a uh, Hokkaido fishermen as a total uh, caught a uh, uh, 2,000 ton of herring. And uh, if we look at uh, the this in the graph, it's obvious that the amount of the fish, the herring coat is increasing, and the value is increasing. It's great. It's great. And uh, because of that, uh, Japanese fishery agencies that, you know, uh, thinks that the herring is one of the few fishery resources that Japan's doing very well in terms of resource management. If we look at it, that's probably true. But uh, if we look at it, look at this. This graph started at 1960s. That means this graph start with the year after Japanese domestic fishery corrupted. Let's look at historical perspective. 1870s, year 2020. Is this is an example of a successful resource management or one of the few resources that the Japan can be proud of in terms of resource management. Of course, the fishermen doing their job, doing great, and the scientists working together. But if we look at the historical perspective, still we have a long way to go in terms of the restoring the local having resources. But still, it's great to have the local having stock back to the market and also local foodscape. If we go to supermarket in the winter time in Hokkaido, 
we see the pack of fresh herring, the salt. Uh, 100 gram, 45 yen. That's my gosh. It's pretty, pretty cheap. If we go to a local sushi restaurant, we can eat herring nigiri sushi, which tastes great. We didn't have such kind of food 40 years ago, 50 years ago. But now we can have it. Consumer can enjoy it. Sushi chef enjoy using local herring. And local fishermen enjoy seeing local consumers enjoying the, herring, the local herring that they caught. Kazunoko too. Kazunoko is uh, one of the major delicacy or controversial food in South Alaska. Because in Alaska, we harvest a lot of herring to produce herring sacro to export to Japan. By uh, uh, recovering the local domestic herring uh, fisheries, Japanese fishermen and, uh, and the processors producing a nice pack of uh, kazunoko using domestic herring resources, domestic herring kazunoko. And the local consumers enjoy as well. By having the uh, local herring resources, we can now, people can use those resources for, uh, for local community revitalization. They can celebrate the restoration or recovery of local human resources. Start doing a new a festival. But uh, it's, that's great that we now, we have a lot of local herring resources in Japan. The resource of recovery, fishermen can catch herring, they're making some money. And the fish, uh, local sushi restaurant, we can enjoy nice herring sushi. But the one problem that I still uh, think is, very, is important to think about is a cleanly gap. That means now we lost so much cleanly knowledge and skill in terms of using herring at home. Japanese people used to use the dried herring to make a slow cooked herring fish food, the slow cooked dish, uh, herring with eggplant. It tastes great, but it takes time to make this dish. They need to soak the dried fish, dried herring for a while, and marinate it, and slow cook. And not many Japanese consumers do this anymore. We can enjoy sashimi. We can buy it at the grocery store. But in the past, a lot of uh, a local household, local people in Hokkaido used to make uh, fermented herring food. Ferment, another fermented herring fish food. These are traditional food. But again, a knowledge and the skill of making those kind of traditional fermented food disappeared because of the uh, culinary or gastronomic uh, rift. We did have a herring on the supermarket in 1970, 1980s. But uh, because we didn't have uh, local herrings, a lot of uh, culinary knowledge and uh, relationship between local herring and local people uh, disappeared. So, uh, and uh, there, are a lot, there are a lot of uh, you know, herring product in the supermarket grocery store in Japan, but uh, not many Japanese consumers make a used herring at home anymore. almost eight o'clock, so I'm just running. So I quickly overview the history of a herring fishery in Japan, how herring resources are overexploited, along with indigenous Ainu people. Then, but how Japanese uh, put uh, energy and effort funding for the hatchery program, and the fishermen uh, tried their best to do the regulation, uh, resource management, and local herring fishery recovering slowly, but still uh, a lot of cleanly knowledge that has been lost, has been revived yet. 
And uh, today I put the title in the presentation of the, the why the, the eating herring. I put uh, this title both a metaphorical and also realistic way. In Japan, if we think about the to think about and also come up with uh, a sustainable relation, sustainable relationship between herring and human or the human, the Japanese society and the local environment. We really think about herring as a whole, not just as a food. As we talk about uh, the one of the audience today, you know, salmon eat herring, whale eat herring. Herring is a very important resource, not for human, but for the environment. So we need to think about what we eat, especially seafood, you know, where the food comes from. And uh, Japanese people love eating fish, but I always tell my students that, you know, it's okay to eat fish, but uh, please remember, please think where those fish come from and uh, what this fish really is. But because otherwise, uh, the loss of culinary knowledge, especially on the seafood, continue disappearing. And the relationship between a fish and human continue declining. This is the, it's kind of funny, uh, the video that I want to show you and to share. This is a social experiment that the one of the uh, Japanese broadcasting company and uh, an aquarium collaborated to see how serious gastronomic rift or a loss of relationship between us and the fish could be. This is not about the herring. This is the salmon, by the way. Oops, the sound doesn't come up. Do children? So it's supposed to be with come with a nice sound, but uh, let's go with it. So this is a social experiment. Scientist and engineer work with aquarium. Created salmon robot. Salmon fillet, semi like a salmon. What's that? Kids are amazed. Salmon fish. Salmon swimming. What fish is this? It has a mouth. Strange fishes. Strange fishes. So she noticed something wrong with this fish. Such a fish doesn't exist. Let's learn more about fish. Here in South Alaska, here in Juneau, you guys, I'm jealous of you guys. You guys can go fishing and see the real fish, real salmon, real herring. But in Japan, we love eating seafood, but we don't see fish most of the time, especially kids. Nutritionists, a lot of people talk about, let's eat more fish for healthy diet, which is true. But at the same time, we need to think about how seafood come from. Otherwise, children, female generation, think about salmon is like that. That's why in, in the university that I'm working, that has a food studies program, I teach history and the culture of the well, food culture, the food and the human ocean relationship. But at the same time, we did we do have a kitchen. So the college student learn about how to cook fish. They take a lecture from me about herring, herring fishery, the history of herring, issue of resource management. The, after that, they go to the kitchen and they take a culinary class. See the, her see the herring real fish 
and slice the fish and cook the fish. And I think this is, a some, this is a one of the things that uh, more a university in the United States, including the U.S., should do. Like the native people here in the, cent in the Central Council of Queen the Hyder do the food distribution, the food program. These are great. The university should do that too. It's very important to give an opportunity to students, the opportunity to touch, see, and sense the fish before saying like, I love sushi, I love tuna. My students are doing uh, some project with uh, one of the major uh, seafood company to come up with a new recipe to utilize domestic herring fish. And uh, this is not, this is just a small project. Uh, we just started. But uh, I think I'm really enjoying this class and I'm really enjoying spending time with my students because they, until they met me, they didn't know what herring is. But now they know the hearing aids. So uh, at the end, I want to emphasize that, uh, that at the end, I want to emphasize that today I will talk about the history of herring fishery, uh, seafood. But at the end, I want to uh, mention that the importance of culture. Of course, in eating food, eating fish is very good. Resource management is very important. But at the both uh, area, resource management or eating culture, the eating, our eating habit, the food waste, we need to put culture in the middle. Scientific knowledge is very important, but we need to put the historical, we need to put the cultural context. Otherwise, again, local resources could be utilized for the something that would not be beneficial for local community or local ecosystem. Local, it would be great, it's, it should be, uh, it'd be great if local resources utilize more for the local community. And I think, you know, the eating and the cooking, actually, knowing fish and the cooking fish, and one of the steps, we can put the culture and we can use culture to start restart redesigning the more sustainable relationship between human society and the ocean. So it's about a time, so I'll stop here and I'll just you know, take any, any question as you like. I want to I'll put some name on here. Uh, as in the current said, I'm here since last February and so many people taking care of me and my family a lot. And I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot of more local people here. And I still have uh, three months in here, and I, I hope to continue learning from local people here, native, non-native people. Uh, but uh, at the same time, again, I'm, I'll be here to the end of November. So if you'd like to know more about the Japanese food culture, Japanese history, if you are educated, if you are, you know, the anyone, if you're interested, you know, just, you know, shoot me an email and I'm happy to give another lecture, another talk on another cooking workshop, for example, to get to know with each other and to think about the more sustainable way of the, the ocean human relationship. Thank you very much. Good night, Tish. Uh, we'd love to see if anybody has questions. And also, um, while we're doing questions, we also have cookies and fruit back there. We want to keep the question and answer session really relaxed. So please feel free to also get up. And we've got coffee and some teas and some fruit and cookies. So please help yourself to that while we're having some conversation. So do we have any questions? Richard. I, I don't have questions. Uh, I want to say domo arigato, Shingo-san. Uh, this really filled my heart uh, hearing and seeing this, getting to know Shingo. Herring are the lifeblood of our ocean. 
And I don't think even here in Southeast Alaska, so many people have yet to appreciate how important herring are to the entire ocean. And you, you touched on salmon eat herring, whales eat salmon and herring. Um, our system, the parallels between the history of Japan and here in Southeast Alaska for the Klinkin Haida people, we feel like the Aino. Uh, we, were, we took part in the overfishing not we weren't made uh, necessarily slaves, but we were pushed into uh, Western ways of money and trade. And I come from the village of Kassan on Prince of Wales Island. It's where I'm pretty much born and raised. My people have fished in that area for tens of thousands of years. A lot of people will tell me how Wow, I'm really impressed with your people. You survived in harsh climates. You've done this. We did not survive in harsh climates. We thrived in one of the most giving ecosystems in the world. And we took part of over resource extraction. And we're living it today. And in my village, there is no herring. Yet I can show you pictures where it looks like feet of snow and it's the herring spawn. I can show you pictures that my parents and grandparents and their generations had. I had never seen herring spawn until I went to Mount Edgecombe High School in Sitka, which is now the last bastion of the herring fishery, really in Southeast Alaska, not including the, kelp, uh, the herring row on kelp, that happens on Prince of Wales. But I think it's a tale that we should listen to. I think our Alaska state management is doing a deplorable job. Sorry if any of you in the room are part of that system. But that biomass out there, they're telling us we're having record numbers in biomass. My own traditional knowledge in my short lifetime will tell you different. Going to school at Mount Edgecombe, I saw spawn as far as the eye could see. And what they're saying now is, oh, they're still there, they've just moved. That's ignorance. That's not utilizing Western or traditional science in a good way. It's letting industry push their science to the wrong conclusions. And I think this should be a warning to everybody because, sure, climate change is definitely a factor today were the reason for it. And that's an unpopular statement, but our overconsumption, our over resource extraction is really damning our communities. And I would really love to see our tribe and the university work together because moving to Juneau nine years ago, I was shocked at how many people didn't even really know the taste of herring eggs. And not just our non-native friends, but even our native people don't know that taste anymore. A taste I was fortunate to grow up on, but it's going away. And I think if you touch, feel, taste, hear, smell something, gives you an appreciation for it in a different way. And I'd like to see us as a community come together and learn those things, not native or non-native, but the people here and show that we care about these resources and that we can develop resource management that not only gives the consumer something, but sees a regenerative fishery. And that's my hope and dream because right now industry drives it. And I was really keenly aware of what you said that in Japan, the industry is part of the decision making and I pray and hope for ours to realize you should be wanting to preserve this for future generations of fishermen, but it's, you know, go full tilt now, get what you can now, and nothing left. And I think that's very problematic here. Konnichiwa for this really excellent presentation. Anybody else comments, questions? Saw it. Oh, hi. 
yeah, just um, in the big picture, um, um, in sustainability, we're treating the ocean completely different than way we've known how to uh, uh, grow food and feed us on land. I wondered if you had any comment on that. We treat the ocean as uh, limitless. We could just do these extractive uh, industries or resource take without any real recycling of the nutrients. In fact, the herring were used to fertilize our fields, right? We've known f for a long time that we need to return nutrients to the soil. And I'm just wondering what you thinking is on that and how you think uh, even any enhancement, like you mentioned, even fits in there. Well, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to comment on it. Well, uh, but the sustainability, yes, you know, there are the three, uh, three pillars of sustainability, right? Social sustainability, economic sustainability, and environmental sustainability. And they are both important, and uh, they're all important, but uh, I'm a culture anthropologist by training. And, uh, and uh, back to the, it kind of tied with the, what the, uh, Richard said about the resource management. Uh, fish and resource management are done by the you know, fish and game. And uh, of course, there are some issues, there are problems, but uh, I, I would say you know, they're doing what they could do best. But I want to uh, mention that no, they're doing what they can do best. That means use of a scientific knowledge and uh, put the ecology and uh, economy in the picture. That's very important too. But at the same time, you know, nowadays you know, we, we start thinking about we start talking about put cultural aspect in the middle. Not just ecology, not just economy. We need to have a culture. Culture. Because if we, if we think about how we can utilize heavy resources here, of course we can use ecology and economy. But we need to know how important the resource is for local people here. That's why culture is very important. And so the local resources, yes, you know, that would be great if you know, people can utilize heavy resources in South Alaska to make a you know, fish meal fertilizer to create a more nutrient in the soil, which is great. And that's one way to utilize the local heavy resources for local community in Alaska, rather than going to Japan or rather than going to China to make a you know, fish meal for the aquaculture there. Use the resource, local resources for local community. For agriculture, for the fishery, and but again, uh, one of the things we could start doing, like uh, just use herring as the local food culture. Yes, it's bony; it's kind of hard to process how to cook. cook. But actually, if you cook well, nicely, it tastes really nice. Herring tastes good. So fish egg, the herring egg is good. About the same time, and I hope you know, we can think about how we can uh, redesign the relationship between local herring here in South Alaska and the local people here in South Alaska. Any more questions? Oh, uh, I just had a question on the, that graph. I thought it was kind of interesting um, showing the decline in herring and there's that real low dip in about 1936, I think. Do you Did you come across anything in your research as to what happened at that time? What, what time? Uh, around 1936, when it looks almost at zero, 1936. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah did you uh, come across any reason why that was significantly lower? Uh, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't, I haven't studied that part enough. But uh, the hidden resources, really fluctuate. Sometimes they got a bad year, sometimes they have a good years. And also this is about a time when the, uh, the, way the, the war started between Japan and China. And also when the Japan started engaging war with the United States, that might be something to do with it. I have a question about the graph too. So I see that when it was really high, it's almost mm. like a hundred is that a million yes, tons a year? Mm -hmm. And then over there, 
it's down to like the very end of the graph. It's down to maybe ten thousand, maybe twenty thousand. Yes. Yeah, twenty thousand. Twenty thousand a mm. year. So what you and you said that now local people are already enjoying local herring. To me, it looks like still it's tiny, teeny <laughs> little bit. So when it was like one million ton, what would people doing with it? Were they exporting it? Or were they eating it? And I just feel like twenty thousand compared to that is like nothing. It's still like not enough for the mm -hmm. people to mm -hmm. feel any difference. And then the other question I have is about um, what to do. Like if you want to revive the population of herring, uh, we ha we need to understand the cost, right? So we, you say like over what um, what's that? Uh, we catch too much, right? We catch them too much. So if we stop catching, would would they come back? Or if it is climate change, I don't know if it is how climate change will affect it. I don't know if it will affect it. Well, then if if it, if it does affect it. How, what can we do? Thank you. Most interesting question. Uh, first, yes, if we look at this <laughs> annual catch record in the past 120 years, yes, the recovery was really tiny. And again, uh, what people used to do with the human resources in the back, most of the human resources are used to produce fish meal fertilizer. Only a small fraction of those catch are used for food, human food consumption. And those human food consumption are the mainly limited to the local community. And the dry herring was produced and dry herring was in exported to mainland Japan. But the most of the resources are used to fish meal fertilizer to develop the modern agriculture. And the resource decline because of overfishing, but at the same time, Demand of fish meal fertilizer declined as well. Now, by around that time, you know, you know, uh, chemical fertilizer were developed, so the farmers, you know, didn't have to buy or use fish meal fertilizer. So again, another ecological rift, you know, created. Japanese people, you know, decide not to use local fisher resources, the organic a fish meal fertilizer. Instead, they use a chemical fertilizer created from elsewhere, United States or other places. So that's why in this graph is very, uh, so people there used, really used the fishery resources, herring resources, but as a food, tiny. And then now, the catch is tiny, but uh, they don't have to use the herring to produce fish meal fertilizer. Still, the herring are used to, to produce the you know, fish meal for the, for the aquarium, for example, and for the bait fishing like here in South Alaska. But mainly in Japan, those resources for use for the food consumption. And the second question, so, the, so if we, if I hope that in you know, the local herring resources in Japan recovered more in the face of climate change, what, uh, what local fishermen could do, what local consumer could do. Not catching might be the answer? Maybe. At least if we stop catching herring, we don't, we don't put a, a pressure, fishing pressure to the herring stocks. But at the same time, again, it go back to the story of sustainability. We need local people. We need to respect the uh, livelihood of a local fishermen. They need a fish to catch. So I always, you know, I sometimes say to my student and another academic conference, this is oxymoron, but uh, if we want to uh, restore and uh, come up with a sustainable resource management, we need to continue eating. We see, I say like, uh, eating to conserve. By us consumer spending money eating local fish, money go to the local fishermen, local community. Then they can have some money and a moment to think about 
how they can continue uh, using their local fisher resources in a more sustainable way. Let's think about it for future gen saving some resources for future, future generations. So by stop catching fish, yes, we can, we can you know, decrease the fishery pressures on the local ecosystem. But if we think about uh, local community, local sustainability, I would say let's continue eating. <laughs> but we need to be careful. We need to be wise consumers. If we go to supermarket, where does fish come from? Norway, Chile, somewhere in Europe, or South Alaska? Why not Alaska? For the salmon, for example, or the herring too. So, as as the food studies scholars, I want I I cannot emphasize enough about the power of the food culture or eating. Eating could be very dangerous tool, dangerous, but at the same time, eating could be really great, not weapon, really good tool to redesign our a new way of life, a new sustainable way of life. Hi, uh, thank you for that wonderful talk. It was very thought provoking. Um, I'm wondering, what happened to the native peoples of Hokkaido? Well, uh, what happened with the microphone? <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much for the very important questions. Uh, indigenous Ainu people still live in Hokkaido and outside of Hokkaido. And uh, there, gosh, there will be, a, there should be another public lecture about this. Well, I would say the uh, Japanese government uh, speak of Ainu people with two tongues. Japanese government recognize Ainu people as uh, indigenous people of Japan. But at the same time, they don't uh, recognize any indigenous right to harvest fish deer, bear, or any other wild resources by Ainu people. Because Japanese government said that we don't know what we mean by indigenous. It's kind of weird, right? They recognize Ainu people as the indigenous people of Japan, so they said, you know, we want to promote, we want to help, we want to support Ainu people to restore, revitalize, and recreate Ainu culture, so they put the money on Ainu art activities, but the same, but the same time, they keep shutting the door about fishing right issue or hunting right issue. So that's been a huge issue in Japan, and uh, Japanese media don't cover m about this much. So this is another thing, you know, that we need to think about, especially as, as a Japanese scholar, Japanese anthropologist doing the research on fisher resource management or fishing culture, the seafood culture. Because you know, in the coastal and you know, Ainu people, when, when I ask Ainu people who live in the coastal area of Hokkaido, what do you think about herring? How important herring was for the Ainu people? Most of the Ainu people living in the coastal area said, herring, what are you talking about? Now, first, I need to think, we need to think about salmon. They, wa they work hard about the restoration of uh, indigenous salmon fishing rights, but they don't talk about having fishing rights because of the gap. Japanese people colonize, colonize and settle the coastal area of Hokkaido 500 years ago. So most of the traditional Ainu way of life in coastal area disappeared. So it's really hard for contemporary Ainu people to think about their traditional relationship between herring and Ainu. I've heard Japanese people refer to Hokkaido as the Alaska of Japan, and I'm very curious as to what the climate is like, what the land is like, is it mountainous? And more importantly, how's the diving over there? Diving? Diving in Hokkaido. Are we diving? Yeah. 
I'm a diver. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, you know, Hokkaido. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. You know, Hokkaido is like uh, Alaska of the United States. It's a so called last frontier. And uh, Hokkaido is located right next to Russia, same as Alaska. So Japanese people started colonizing Hokkaido because of the geopolitical tensions. They want to claim that Hokkaido is a part of Japan. That's why they colonized Hokkaido as quickly as possible and try to assimilate Ainu people as possible. Turn Ainu people into the Japanese to claim that indigenous traditional Ainu land, where this is the Japanese territory, not Russians. So that was the history. But the climate-wise, nature-wise, yes, you know, there are beautiful oceans, rich uh, fish resources, ocean resources, a lot of mountains. Hokkaido is known for the premier ski recreation, the spot. So a lot of uh, international tourists you know, go to Hokkaido. Even, for example, you know, uh, people living people like uh, living in Banff, Canada, go to Hokkaido for skiing. Because they said, uh, gosh, the, the quality of the snow in Hokkaido is really great. So, yes, nature wise, I would think it is quite uh, similar. And history wise, the how local, how indigenous people were exploited or, or oppressed is the same as well. And for the diving, uh, I'm not a diver myself, so I, don't, I cannot talk much, but. Uh, yeah, the water's cold. <laughs> 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 water's cold. But uh, yes, you will enjoy the diving in uh, Hokkaido. But Any more questions? Uh, let's give our speaker a big round of applause. Thank you. I also wanted to invite all of you to please join us for our next evening at Egan Lecture. Uh, we have three more scheduled, um, October 13, November 10, and December 8, and our next lecture will be right here. And we'll be talking about brain health and aging and some new developments in brain health. So I look forward to seeing you all here the next time we gather. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.